Welcome back. It is week four. We are in the product value creation, bit of applied theory, and a couple of conceptual frameworks for you to work with time. One of the things about this particular series of ideas is that we're going to use a classification framework to describe different types of online product, uh, products that you can create for the internet environment. That classification framework will recur later in the semester. So content featured here links forward to other content. So we're going to deal with product. And I want to do a quick reminder that back in Intro to Marketing, you would have encountered the product concept. And basically, three things you need to know or remember. Core customer value, controlled by the customer. We can do our best to create an actual product supplemented by the associated and extended augmented product. But at the end of the day, the customer determines value, and that's why co-creation of value works, is that we are not the sole arbiters of value. Which brings us to co-creation of value. Under the modern marketing understanding, a product is an offering that has value, which has been communicated to an audience and is ready to be exchanged with that audience for something of value through one of our delivery mechanisms. What's key to us understanding here is that nothing has an inherent value. There is no inherent merit in any product or value offering. Value comes from its ability to match with an audience's needs, to create a solution from the offering we provide, combining with the problem, need, or want that the audience is facing. So our goal is to build a value offer that has some opportunity for our customer to contribute. And that contribution can be as simple as read, observe, embrace the idea, the knowledge. If you're looking at a photo on an Instagram account, the exchange can be a like for, hmm, that is an aesthetically pleasing, like. It doesn't have to be a big transaction. It doesn't have to be a big exchange of value. But there needs to be some ongoing value transaction. In social media, relationship marketing also allows us to transfer potential audienceship, that is our follower counts, the subscriber counts, as a relationship marketing, trust, commitment, and reciprocity, that over time, by being a follower, the reciprocity of exchange, the reciprocity of value, will even out in the end. The content that we create is valued by the audience, and the audience itself becomes something that we can transact. But probably the critical thing to remember is that you can't force an opportunity. You can't force a value. Now, the next thing we want to address in this is in service dominant logic, there are two ideas. And they've got one letter separating them because Vargo and Lush thought this through and did it anyway. In the front end, we have the operant resources. And these are embedded in our customer. This is where the co-creation value is tying into ideas such as access and ideas such as what does the customer need to be able to do in order to get value from your product or your offering. So the operant resources are the skills and knowledge. They are the resources that you use to act on an operand resource. The operand resource, in our case as e-marketers, are sites, software, content, applications. Quick case in point is the operant resource is the skill set that you have as a student. And the operand resource is this video. The way in which you take these ideas and you apply these ideas is the use of your operant resources on my operand resources of this content. In our social media platforms, the operand resources, skills and knowledge are often things like understanding. If you're using a meme and you're using a pop culture reference, the knowledge 
of that reference is the operant resource that helps the image with some text on it be valuable to the end user. I uh, just explain memes using co-creation of value. What does my life become? All right, creating value and use. Now, the Ballantine and Vary paper 2006 are quite an influential paper on my understanding and how I process uh, co-creation of value. So it's worth having a look at and worth having a read. It was also one of the very early papers to extend the value frameworks and think about how value in ownership, value in use, and a whole range of alternate beyond Vargo approaches and interpretations. It's also a quick historical footnote, the Australians totally, and the Kiwis totally got into co-creation of value before the Northern Hemisphere did. But what are you looking at here? The three things in a co-creation, creating value and use is, does the value emerge from a set of expertise? And some of that expertise can be, value is co-created because it's an ongoing part of our relationship the longer you're in the subject, the more you know about the subject content, so the more value you'll be able to create because you've got a bigger portfolio of e-marketing knowledge to act upon. Equally, the knowledge renewal, based on your prior experience, you can extend and expand. This is more information towards the processing. And when we think about the consumer behavior theories, when we talked about the idea of what are post consumption events, that we had the idea of renewing that cycle of recognition, problem recognition into uh, search and solution. This is where knowledge renewal, value comes through, I am better at this now. There's also the ability to communicate the offer and communication around the offer. So we're looking at things like branding, we're looking at things like the capacity to understand the value offer, but also communicate it. This is why it's valuable and this is why it's useful. But it's worth having a look at these deeper papers to go and say, well, how will I use this? What will I aim to do with my project that helps focus down into one of these domains of how I can get more value for my customer out of my offer? The value and use, quick recap and bringing us back to a couple of things that we have talked about previously in previous lectures. Value and use says that value only exists in the process of using the product, which means that value has to come from the co-production, co-presence of the operant resources, your skills, being applied to the operand resources. The value offer, the actual and augmented product of the value offer. It is a very proactive state. It says that value only, value must be performed, value must be an active process. Which, if you're thinking about your value, what it is you're going to provide, then if you're going down the value and use path, you want to be creating a hook so that people can go, I can take this and use it, or I can respond to it and react to it. And that is their operant resources on your value offer. Value and ownership is all about the mere possession providing value. This is about the saving the object to the hard drive, but if we take the PDF files, if you downloaded the slides for this video and you haven't opened them and you're not taking notes on them, you're not using them, then mere possession has provided value. You've got them if you need them. It is the store of potential future value though. And I will say this, that if you want to grab a bunch of readings that you don't necessarily use this time, but you've got for later, you have a potential bundled value. It also is a way to alleviate uncertainty. I'm going to make a whole lot of content available across the course of the semester, and some people at week one are going to download the lot, because that way they've got it on their hard drive in case something happens. So... That's uncertainty alleviation, and that is a use for value and ownership. Now, value and exchange is all about the transaction. It's the only reason why the NFT exists. Exchange is for value. Value is stored in the object. If the object is exchanged again, value is returned. Uh, this is basically what collections, sales, it's temporary value storage. 
the value comes from the as yet unrealized transaction. As soon as the transaction is realized, you've got that value back and someone else has temporary stored value or someone has a value on use. Now here's an idea that is in the big book of ideas that's available for, as a reading off the website. Things you can do with the internet. The idea of value in prosumption is that there's the prosumer approach of consuming for the purposes of creating. And in social media, this would be an unboxing. It would be a taste testing. It would be doing something where you are applying the operant skill. You're using your skills to unlock value for an audience through the audience's proxy watching, consuming of the product. Or in another way is if I was to do a Pepsi Max review, pleasing taste, some monsterism. My ability to review this is my use of this for content creation. So in essence, value and presumption is everything I've read about the internet, everything I've experienced about the internet, those are the operand resources, which I then translate into me telling you this story right now. Key is, you're using the consumption pattern to produce content, and that's what makes it prosumption. And it is direct benefit to others, whilst you personally are gaining from, you know, here's me reviewing a Pepsi can of Pepsi Max, oh, awesome. I get the caffeine, but you get the review. So the purpose by which the intent and purpose determine what, if it's consumption or if it's prosumption. Now, mentioned this before, but the idea here is as well, post value co-creation. There are three outcomes from co-creation. There is satisfaction, there's cognitive dissonance, which is uncertainty. Uncertainty needs to be resolved. And there's dissatisfaction, which is the lead to cessation of behavior. All of these elements, this is classic consumer behavior, uh, and it's a classic thing of, this is what your product can trigger. Your product can, result in satisfaction, which has at the top end, the box we don't talk about is job done, problem solved, there's no further demand, there's no further need. Satisfaction can resolve in retrial, where it was good, but you want to see if it does it twice. Satisfaction can be, it was good, I want to do that again. And satisfaction can be, this is a, I have an ongoing problem, this is an ongoing solution, let's put the two together and success. Cognitive dissonance is where you need to go and post-process, did it work? Cognitive dissonance will also, on a SIVA aspect, will be, did I get the most value out of my co-creation? Did I need more information? Did I need a better solution? Do I need more skills, more upper end resources in being able to unlock the value. If so, test again. If, no, nah, that's the best I can do and it wasn't very good, cease behavior. And of course, on dissatisfaction, the word no is a full sentence. So you stop the behavior. If the problem that can, if the problem consists of uh, something that you are unable to solve through co-creation, you may go look for a different solution or a different operant operand resource in order to create uh, another co-creation event, i.e. didn't work, try something else. Now, three ideas that are heavily co-connected to each other in this idea of the product and the value offer is the co-creation, co-production and customization. Basically, if you're going to have the value offer your way, you're going to have to put in effort to get the value and extract the value the way you want it. I want to raise two ideas here. I want to talk about lead user innovations. Uh, I don't research this as much as I live it. Uh, this is the doing something with a product that they didn't have in mind when they built it in the lab. For the most part, most of the times people are using social media, they're using it in a way that people were expecting it to be used. If you watch a whole bunch of videos about people doing odd things there. Will it blend? Putting an iPhone in a blender, I know it's an old meme, but that's not what the iPhone designer had in mind with the phone, nor is it what the 
blending technique blend tech guys had in mind for their blender. That means you're doing it in a different way. But one of the things that can come out of this is the idea of your lead users, your innovations, your creations that you come up with, then becoming something that becomes part of the ongoing value offer. Now, there's been a number of cases where someone comes up with a very interesting new approach. And one of the, look, I won't say dumbest, but one of the most blatant I've seen is when the Mars bar, the humble Mars bar, started being used as a cooking ingredient. It was being chopped up and diced into cakes. It was being chopped up and put into Easter eggs. The Mars Corporation detected this through their market research and then released the cooking size Mars bar in the cooking section of the store. Lead use into product modification. And then they started branding cooking Mars bar, eating Mars bar. They were the same products, they just had different labels of what you could do with the value proposition. And it came down to co-creation again. Was it a snack or was it an ingredient? The other thing with uh, user innovation and this approach, it is an older idea in the sense it's early 2000s and it's got a pedigree back into the 90s. But one of the things to be aware of is that there is still a culture, although it's increasingly harder to find, of sharing novel use. Coming up with a different use for a product. Uh, as someone who's periphery to the adult fans of LEGO and the LEGO building community, they're still finding new ways to put LEGO together and they are sharing those uh, both ideas of what to do with the component parts and how to make the component parts interact. They are sharing these concepts with each other and they are creating use innovations. They are creating different ways. For you, as a user of a social media platform, coming up with a way, you don't have to, but I want this to be something that you're aware of. Think different also can output uh, a, legal, a legal letter saying, please don't think again. Just, it's something to be aware of. It's a theory that uh, underpins how, also though, how you use an idea, how you remix an idea, how you reapply an idea. And I have a bit of a track record on lead user innovation when it comes to the um, teaching technology space where people go, we didn't have that in mind when we built it. What are you doing with it in the classroom? Similarly, just want to pick up briefly on customization. Uh, again, here is the paper. And when I talk about the use of theory and the value of theory in e-marketing, there is, in this paper, a discussion around customization. And one of the things is you'll see that there are five different ways you can possibly engage customization from the outset. There are many more ways you probably could work out over time. One of the options is the co-production of value through menu selection. Some of you may have experienced this in other subjects here at the ANU and other subjects here in the marketing major, where you've got menu choices of how you're going to engage. You can do customization through product design. A platform such as Redbubble or GameCrafter allows users to select from a library of component parts and then put customize those component parts, putting them together in different ways to create their own unique value propositions. Equally, a print-on-demand service is the ultimate customization. I'm wearing one, as are things like micro customizations where you get to apply filters to do you want to see this content? Do you want show only content from? Something as basic as the Woolworths online shopping allows you to filter by dietary requirements. That is a micro customization of the user experience. And the last aspect is personalization, of which for those of you who haven't logged into Wattle and updated your forum profile, what will allows you to personalize how you're presented? You can give yourself a little icon, a little backstory. There's a bunch of minor tweaks you can do which become customizations. Twitter allows you to have an icon and a header. 
Most people will never see the header image because most people won't be clicking directly to your profile. But it allows you to personalize, make it yours. Like your Facebook profile, picture like your Facebook profile, page photo, personalizations are a form of customization which are then a value add which become a value co-creation. All right, the product typologies. Let's get stuck into this because welcome to my world. I do typologies and this is one of them. First, I want to say that this framework came from a social change campaign, the social marketing. Uh, it was adapted and I've got it in my e-marketing textbook and I'll have that available if you want to have a look at the full details. But the short variant is that every product can break down across three areas, three dominant areas, and that is the idea, the behavior, or the object. What is the most important aspect of the operand resources that you want someone to focus on? Now here in e-marketing, I would say for this lecture, the most important thing is the idea. But for the subject, the most important thing is the behavior. The least important thing for me is the object. I'm not asking you to buy a textbook, so there's no physical book. The virtual goods, the slides that you download, are only as useful as the application you put them to. The content needs behavioral, recurring, ongoing commitment to running your project, but it also needs an attitude and a belief product. So each of these elements are under the overarching product model. So let's talk about the subcomponents quickly. The belief. This is an understanding. Now, a belief is not, there's no, uh, how should I say? The words that we choose to use here are non judgmental. So, belief is not implying faith, it is implying understanding. I believe this to be true is not a matter of faith, it's that's what I think is the circumstances. Attitudes are the effective, they are, but they're the cognitive processing. It's where you like positive or negative reaction to a product, liking, disliking, there is a sense of, there's the emotive, but also it's filtered through thought. Values are basically heading right back up into your top of your segmentation variables. These are the overarching things that impact on a sub on a content, on a product, and this is where ideas of taboo and ritual come in. So a value, also values, plural, this is that sense of morality, ethics, and socially appropriate behavior. So you can see it links back to a bunch of other concepts, but here the idea product is best in value and use, and hardest in value and ownership, but still present. To know something as to have knowledge of it is ownership. To have a memory of it is ownership. Then to do some of that memory is in use. On the behavior product, there is no value and ownership in behavior. It is only value and use because use is a behavior and behaviors are needed. So your behavior product here can be a one-off. Uh, installing an app. That's the precursor needed to get into the system. Downloading an ebook, one off behavior. Of course, not actually reading the ebook means that you haven't done the value in use, but you needed to perform a single transactional behavior to get things started, and then the recurrent behavior unlocks the value, and that is reading the book, or watching the videos, or using the app. The object side of product is scattered across physical, virtual, and null. Uh, physical, these are the aspects of the product that are necessary to exist in atoms for you to be able to engage with the value. Quite bluntly, across the course of this semester, your phone and your computer, be it a desktop or a laptop or a tablet, are going to be an ongoing recurrent element of this subject because you need it to access it to get to the other parts of the value. 
The virtual product in this case, uh, we're talking data, we're talking access to systems, we're talking uh, anything where you don't have a physical object, even if you're downloading the files, they still reside on a hard drive, the hard drive is the object, the PowerPoint slide is the virtual. And in this, we have the, co the concept of a product which doesn't have a physical or physicality nor a virtuality. And that is the memories, thoughts, and ideas. The ideas you have as incurred during this video, or the thoughts you have, the affect, the emotions, and the experiences you have scrolling your Instagram account or watching TikTok. So you can have value and use in a physical object. You can have value and ownership. And quite often you have value in exchange, the ability to on-sell. Now there's another classification framework that's in play here, and that is the idea of the different ways in which the product can be engaged. Uh, again, I wrote this uh, back in 2011, so over a decade ago, we started wanting people to explore this idea of the internet provisioned content, ideas, knowledge, thoughts, closer to belief. It facilitated experiences and the experiential based of marketing brought in a lot of tourism theory. Services obviously let us bring in services marketing theory. But one of the things we found a little frustrating about up until the time we came up with this typology is that where you needed to have data transferred, non-cloud based engagement, so downloading that PDF, downloading those PowerPoint files, maybe even saving this video to disk. Those become virtual goods. And you need, if you need software to run something, like the media player, if you download to the hard drive and you need VLC as your media player, there is a virtual good, there's a virtual object, there's virtual elements happening. So we wanted to really start looking at these ideas of where it was based inside the computer and it was dominant inside the computer and it could be value in ownership i.e. your mp3 archive um, your collection of files that you don't use all the time but want to have access to when you need them they would be different to the experiences that you've had so this typology exists to let us start working out where is the value proposition likely to lie? What are the requirements of the operant and operating resources to make it work? So breaking it down just a little bit further briefly, I want to walk you through each of these steps. Virtual goods, functionally, they have, what really gives them away is that they have technical dimensions. File sizes, page length, slide counts. They take up space in a somewhere. So virtual goods fill up a virtual world locker uh, files fill up a hard drive and there is a set of logistics involved that you've got to download or you've got to do something some movement of data content delivery is where there is a shift and there's movement of the idea so these can be enhancements to the operant so gaining ideas active learning Secondhand knowledge, uh, stuff that you just find out as a result of, you know, you're watching a movie or you're playing a game or you ch just YouTube's on in the background and you gain some knowledge that you weren't expecting, nor were you actively looking um, to gain. Equally, content delivery allows us for reactions. Content delivery also uh, switches around the whole things of that is a link to the matrix. It would be wonderful if we were at uh, the 1999's view of the metaverse of stick a plug in the back of your skull and download the ability to do Kung Fu. Content also, the, one of the things about this is that we can use the virtual goods. So that little typology is not exclusive. And its purpose is to help you understand where do you need to manipulate elements of the product to make it work better for your audience and to give them the best shot at co-creation. So content, which is functionally the ideas, may need to be distributed over a 
a platform of virtual goods. So the exercises that you do in the seminar are delivered to you via a document file. The value is in what those exercises do for you more than the value is in the document itself. Which leads us into experiences. Slightly different from content delivery in that it's more emotive and it's less cognitive. But this is basically the hedonic side of the internet. It is experiential. It is about stimulus response mechanisms. There's a whole world of consumer behavior to explain it. Functionally, they do need the customer to be engaged. They are co-created. And this is really important because customers can co-create experiences from the damnedest of things. And some of my finest and most ex most amazing moments in video games have also come from outright glitches and problems and bugs that would be solved. Some of the things that I'm happiest with on my use of software over time have been fixed in later updates. So it is about the co-creation. It's really heavily driven and dependent on what the customer is looking to get out. So your operand resources create the conditions upon which the operant creates then the customer unlocks an experience, a hedonic, subjective, personal outcome. It's, I know we've been playing a high level of extraction here. The last item on the square is the virtual services. And this is where the, there is a flow of data, there's a flow of elements, but nothing goes to the hard drive. Nothing is saved on disk, nothing is saved into the phone. It's a service encounter just mediated through a computer or a tablet. So it's a device mediated encounter. It is a service. So it's things like you do your online banking, there's not money saved on your hard drive, which there was. There's a service transaction, and it's just brokered across the technology with all the things that that will entail from services marketing, plus all the things from e-marketing. So I want to quickly bring back new product development because it's really important in that as you create content, you engage in new product development. So A, go back and pick up the stuff we did in week one. And B, let me pick up a combination entree here of product is determined by a few things. New product development is an innovation of some form. So we've got all the elements of innovation theory we've covered previously. What I want to briefly mention here is the subjective elements of the Rogers 1995 five characteristics of innovations apply to each bit of content that you create. So here's the three, first three. What does that bit of content do for your target market? And it might just be novelty is what makes it better. It's a new thing. It's not yesterday's thing. That can be its relative advantage, is that it's newer than the previous object. Or its relative advantage can be something else. But what you need to know is what makes this piece better for the customer right now than any other option. Equally, compatibility. If you've followed a YouTube channel and then you, know, you signed up because you were really keen on seeing their playthrough of uh, Call of Duty, you know, because you wanted to get into the eSports, you wanted to see what it looked like to be an eSports player, and suddenly it's all Stardew Valley all the time, and you're not into Stardew Valley and you don't want to play Stardew Valley, then that Stardew Valley content's not compatible with your Call of Duty lifestyle. So that new content wouldn't have a relative advantage, but also wouldn't have a compatibility. It would break. Uh, questions around observability. Where is the content? If you press like on it, does that like get shared to anywhere else? Does that like get recorded? Because one of the stupidest things Twitter did is they decided that it was vitally important that people's content that they liked be broadcast to random audiences. It's like, no, no, that's the opposite of what we wanted. We wanted our like to go to the person who created the content. We didn't want it to become a, some form of social endorsement mechanism. But Twitter did this because Twitter was looking to go and deal with a 
portion of the audience that needed reassurance of, oh, other people have liked this content? Oh, it's okay for me to like it now. Which we're gonna pick up in just a moment. Complexity. All right, I'm always gonna say this. There is a value for difficult because Dark Souls 3 exists. There is a value for simple. Call of Duty exists. The idea underpinning complexity is how difficult is it and is that difficulty a feature? Duolingo, learning a new language, that is a difficult task and you can play it on easy, difficult or hard. So there are nightmare modes in reality and there's nightmare modes in video gaming. Complexity has its role. For you as a creator, do not assume that your audience automatically needs something to be simple in order to pick it up and engage with it. By the way, I haven't assumed that you needed your assignments to be simple. I figured that you wanted complexity and challenge and you wanted them. That sense of, hell yeah, I'm good, when you achieve off the back of a difficult task. Trialability. This is a really useful one in social media because it's very easy to do content trialability without having to subscribe, which is also why you will see YouTubers go and say at the back of, if you like this content, subscribe for more because they know that there's a trialability me mechanism inside YouTube where the videos get recommended, not necessarily because you're a subscriber, but because the algorithm has blessed that video with, you should be administered to this user base. Equally on trialability, the aspect here is if you're gonna stick things behind a paywall, Patreon, uh, so if you're gonna use Patreon, People need to know what it is that they're getting in for to sign up to buy it in order to want to spend the money. So trialability can be a barrier uh, if it's not present and it's something that people need to uh, mollify and reduce their perceived risk. But equally, trialability can be a challenge for you in retaining users beyond the transaction. And I mentioned the moving the sliding scale of relative advantage. Uh, this is an important idea here. Each category has something that is more important to them than the category either side of them. So the novelty and newness, Twitter's primary base, the 2.5% innovators and the 13% early adopters. Novelty and differentiation were really important, but that capped what Twitter could do because Twitter was inherently a content generation machine. It was a novelty factory constant streaming new stimuli, some of which got viral and popular, that the early adopters could then take to a different platform. You could stay on Twitter and pick up the new trends that you could then post about on some other, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Reddit, which is how we end up with a screenshot of a Twitter, a screenshot of a tweet being reposted to Facebook and then screen capped again and reposted onto Tumblr. Because the early adopters needed something to show their leadership and the early majority needed something to show their followership. Viral content, content that is, re that is scraped from one site and posted to another site. Older content being brought back into your timeline. These are features that suit the early majority and the late majority, the 64, 66, 68% of the audience, AKA the bulk of the money. Innovators need certain characteristics to function. High risk, high churn, high turnover, low impact costs because, hey, shiny, next thing. We don't stay long enough to find out what the problems are. Early adopters need that point of differentiation so they can be followed by the early majority. The late majority needs to be in step so they don't feel left out. And the laggards love them either just sitting out the back of the gun, nah, not for me, or not for me yet. I have this whole theory about laggards, you can ask me about it later. But functionally, what you need to be thinking about is who do you want as your primary target audience and how will you give them the best relative advantage? And is that relative advantage playing old material? Is that relative advantage getting to an early majority and giving them flashbacks and classic cuts and blasts from the past. 
Think about the FM radio band and how much classic uh, music is played because the early majority wants a curated, endorsed by someone else timeline so they feel comfortable in knowing that this is a safe thing to like. And that's okay. It's not judgmental. That is what the early majority wants. They want a curated, safe, socially endorsed, socially adopted element. And the late majority want to make certain that they're not out of step. So they're looking for that too. 68% of the market. It's, it's a good thing to guide them and to support them. And their big money spending audience. So this is why novelty versus nostalgia, the repost, reuse, viral share, go from going to previously used and classic content and it's continuous innovation in one sense but also it's not an innovation at all. It is existing product to existing market that already has seen it before. As I mentioned, the inception uh, that is Corey Doctorow, quite a uh, quite a fabled uh, researcher and thinker in the field of internet stuff, but and a really great fiction novelist. Posting there's a screenshot from Twitter posted to Reddit, which is then screenshot and posted to Twitter. No wait, that's Tumblr. That's below in the background, which is then has been screenshot and posted, which has been screenshot and posted. This content is from 2018. It is old content, but it is safe content because it has been around now for three and a half years. And that's what the early majority wants. They want safe content. They want endorsed by others content. All right, quick dive into Siva on the way past as part of the product. Uh, again, holistic incorporation the value offer that you are creating needs to be accessible and accessibility is both does the value proposition have the relevant operand resources attached to it and do the users your target audience do they have the necessary skills abilities and operand resources to unlock that value equally and we'll pick up some of this in segmentation again in positioning strategy is the product is also the communication of value and the uh, information in SIVA is also connected to how is the product branded and promoted and is that a feature of the value offer itself? All right, last thing to talk about, let's talk about theory. Let's talk about a conceptual paper. Uh, there's two things, uh, this paper, this is a discussion about how pastry chefs were using Instagram. And the idea here is that it's all about stakeholder management. And you're like, what's stakeholder management got to do with product? Instagram here, the operative theories is that the chefs themselves have an open source cooking protocol. So when you develop something in terms of your capacity to create a product, you are encouraged to share that development with the wider community. So rather than making an exclusive value offer, your strength as a practitioner comes from your ability to share more content, to share innovation, to share practice. So there's a publication, but there's equally a recognition of the practice. Uh, and there's some very interesting aspects here, not least of which is this broke down to to the two insights I took from the paper. Insight number one is that who knew that chefs have a code of conduct, that there is honor amongst chefs. But what came really useful for me is that there was a typology of Instagram content. In amongst all this things around product development is there were three types of Instagram content. Therefore, there are three types of value proposition you can create with your Instagram account. And these were the social presence, uh, posts that maintained the account and kept the account going. The value of demonstrating your credit of the sources, crediting your sources and the influencers, recognizing that your work 
is attributable to others because it's an open source community. That is also a really, you want to see the most practical real world application of referencing. You see how angry chefs get with other chefs if they think that there is some form of chef plagiarism going on. Particularly if it's inadvertent chef plagiarism, they probably would rather that you were sneaky and devious than you were uh, ignorant of your influences. And the third thing is that creation of value through sharing of an open source idea. Creating something new, explaining how the platform works, or explaining and detailing so others could learn from them. Now these are products. These are value offers. The value offer of the creative ethics, the recognition of those who have come before me, including through tagging, including through building networks, showing this is the path. My work has been influenced by the work of another. So I recognize them, I credit them, I cite them as an influence, I tag them in the post. I have created something of value for my audience to be able to say, hey, I want to know more, I will follow the person who you have been influenced by. These are product types, these are product elements, these are content ways in which you can engage with the internet and through Instagram. And that's my take home out of this paper is types of content, types of content that can be turned into products. Products which are offerings that have value mediated through the medium of Instagram. And with that, if you need me, I'm on Insta, uh, at Stephen there. Contact me over the email, hit us up on the usual channels through uh, the Wattle. And with that, product's a big area. It's really influential and it's going to have a huge impact on how much fun you get to have this semester. And I'd like you to have a lot of fun. So embrace it, use it, enjoy it, and see you on the next one.